The fifth and sixth episodes of Farscape Season 1 are, to be perfectly honest, not very good and do not give us much new information or depth of our characters or further the grand story arc. So, I will treat them together in this deep dive. Back and back and back to the future, and thank God it's Friday again, are perhaps the most Star Trekian of the Farscape episodes. The plot of BBBF rests on the trope of Crichton having hallucinations about the future. The episode has always reminded me of the Star Trek Next Generation episode Frame of Mind, which uses a similar trope. TGIFA is Trekian in a shortcut of a planet on which everyone and everything exists within a couple of city blocks, and it's rather unimaginatively drawn aliens. Both episodes more or less revolve around Dargo. In BBBF, we meet a new species, the Elanics, who are... Genetic cousins to the Luxons. Our races have been blood allies for over 1,000 cycles. We don't learn much more about the Elanics, but we do learn a little about Dargo's background. I have left out one part. The crime for which I was imprisoned. Was it treason? No, it... Then I don't need to hear of it. Matala and I owe you our lives. Whatever your past, exile from your own kind is atonement enough. Unfortunately, the episode spends most of its time with Crichton being confused by his hallucinations. It's not clear how much of his visions are being caused by Matala and how much by the singularity that zaps Crichton early in the episode. In any event or recurring events in this case, Crichton has flashes of the future, which reveal that Matala isn't an Atlantic, but a Scorpion, whoever they are, who must be stopped. And of course, it is Crichton who stops her. I believe these premonitions of Crichton's are genuine. He is convincing enough. We need to subdue Matala as a precaution, if nothing else. Pilot, I need Starburst, and I'm talking right now. Okay, a little enjoyable to see her torn apart by a black hole. However, though, BBBF is watching Crichton annoy everyone else and Dargo again being ineffectual. Not much fun, not terribly interesting. Yes, we do get that tease about Dargo's true crime. Nothing you can say to me that... You just shut up and you listen to me. In that future conversation, when Matala offers you to go to the Elonic Wars, you tell her it is impossible. You tell her that your crime, the crime that you were imprisoned for, would stand in the way. Now, not the crime that you told us, not the crime that you say you were imprisoned for, but the real crime. The crime that you've been keeping secret from everybody on board this ship. How do you know that? You can't. Well, I didn't know. In TGIFA, Dargo creates a problem for the others again. We learn about Luxon Hyper Rage. Crichton! 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 Where is the human? Bring him to me. You're dead. It's been Bring three days. He still can't be freaking like that. It's Luxon Hyper Rage. It doesn't just go away. Bring you were wise to, to hide as you did, John. Uh. So everyone chases after Dargo, who has escaped to a planet that has escaped from a Star Trek episode. And the red-orange cult planet has a strange effect on Dargo. Dargo, have you been laboring? I have. What is wrong with you? I think everything is right. Now there is just contentment. You are a warrior. Act like one. I'm an old warrior. I mean, a prisoner now and a fugitive longer than I was ever a warrior. Don't you think it was time I stopped lying to myself about who I really am? Now, that scene is actually significant in that we get our first look beneath Dargo's front of acting the big tough warrior. We shall see the importance of that line about lying to himself about who he really is. 
The planet and its inhabitants are uninspired, especially their apparent leader, Volme. The real interest unfolds back on Moya, where Eren has to save Rigel, who unwittingly has become a danger. The assassins! The bastards are trying to kill me! Rigel? What the hell happened here? A bomb! Mere henters from where I was. I was relieving myself. Rigel, did you see anyone? No. No one. One moment I was... was... Yeah, relieving yourself. And the next? And the next? BOOM! I've suffered many assassination attempts on Hymeria, but... Nobody knows you here. It's only people who know you who want to kill you. Rigel, who eats anything and everything, has consumed enough of the local produce to become combustible. doing this to me? Don't move. Don't move. You have to feel for the little guy. What am I going to do now? What are we going to do now? Freeze Rigel, of course. But that leaves it to Aaron to solve the mystery of the exploding Rigel. I don't want to do this. Officer Sun, please. You are making progress. Look, it's just really tedious. Sometimes science is, but Domina Rigel's life depends on our finding the cause of this phenomenon and rectifying it if we can. But with Pilot's help, she does it. So, what are you saying? That it's done? That I did it? it you did? No, you helped me a lot. No, Erin Sun. It was you. <laughs> it was me. It is only because of Volme's delusional greed that it is revealed that this planet is a source of Peacekeeper's ammunition. Right. Rigel, now. Now, Rigel! Take them! <laughs> Well, that little demonstration, thank you very much, Rigel, was fueled by the Tanit route. The others, the ones who collect the Tanit, they use it to fuel that pulse rifle there. Peacekeepers. When the Tanit is processed and mixed with the right chemicals like it is in Rigel's stomach... It makes shakin oil. Do you understand what that means? It fuels all Peacekeeper weapons. So this happy plant that you love so much, it's used to kill. They use it to imprison and to enslave. Winning the pissing match, our heroes do the Star Trek thing of interfering with the local natives only enough to leave them on their own. Oh, so convenient. What do we learn in these episodes? Not much in Back and Back and Back to the Future, other than that the Elonics exist and that Dargo is accused of a yet-to-be-revealed crime. Thank goodness this Friday again shows us another side of Erin, not that we ever thought of her as unintelligent. Her success in the lab diagnosing Rigel is a big step in her becoming more than a peacekeeper infantry grunt. Most revealing in the episode is the other side of Dargo, the side that doesn't want to be a warrior. When I was a boy, I dreamed of two very different lives. I would be a magnificent warrior, merciless in battle, fearless, the kind they write Shindok's sonnets about. That is a healthy dream. And I also wanted the simple life. Family, children, a fresh garden that I planted with my own hands. Dargo's other dream is very significant, as we shall see. Finally, we do get one of the best lines in Farscape. Hey, right. Mm -hmm. What's up with her? Oh, she thinks she's a scientist now. False superiority! I am not a scientist. I am, however, what I have always been, and that is superior. If I were warmer, I would have an appropriately venomous reply. And I'm sorry, that's really all I have for these two episodes. As you can tell, I'm not terribly impressed by them. But there is much more and better things to come. 
It's a cold spring where I am as I record this, but our next deep dive will heat things up as Crichton clicks with someone, well, two someones. Support the Farscape Continues project by clicking on the Ko-Fi link in the description and leaving a tip. See you next time.